You can open your Bible to uh, Revelation 8. To begin with, we're going to cover a fair amount of ground today in our study. And so for that reason, I want to get started. But I wanted to say this. In our, uh, in our study, we are looking at the, uh, what life will be like, a little bit of what life will be like on the earth after the rapture of the church. What Somebody that's left behind... What can they expect? And so that's what we've been looking at. And, and not in great detail. We don't have, we, I've not taken the time to go into all of these judgments the way we did whenever we studied the book of Revelation. If you would desire that, you could go back to our website and all of that is archived on there and you would get a lot more detail than what you get out of these messages. So we're just kind of doing an overview of uh, what life will be like. But going through this, I did want to get some detail of things that I didn't want you to miss uh, coming along the line. And they, they were probably things that we talked about before, but I wanted to bring them to your attention again. Now, we have looked at, in, in, let me back up. After the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church, and we defined that, that is the time when when Christ will come back in the air, not to the earth, but in the air, to take those of us that know Christ as Savior, to snatch us away from the face of the earth and take us to be with Him in eternity. That event will then start what is known as the tribulation period, which will be a, a seven-year period that will come on the face of the earth that will be far worse than anything the world has ever seen. In that period of time, there are three sets of judgments. There are sealed judgments, there are trumpet judgments, and there are bowl judgments. Now, we have come through the, the sealed judgments, and we've come through half of the bowl judgments, or half of the trumpet judgments. So we're going to pick it up in the middle of the trumpet judgments today and then try our best to get through all of the bowl judgments and finish this out, and next week come back and get back to our study in the book of Ephesians. That is the plan. So just to give you a little bit of a reminder, the seal judgments that take place that are, that are recorded in Revelation chapter 6, those seal judgments happen in the first half of the tribulation period. When the trumpets start, it is believed that the trumpets start the second half of the tribulation. There is something you can either notice your Bible or I'll show you on the screen. There's something that is said at the start of the trumpet judgments that we skipped over that I wanted to touch on just for a moment. But verse, and you read it in chapter, Revelation 8, 1 through 5, and here's what it says. It says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, okay, so we had six seals of judgments, the seventh seal then contains the trumpets, and then the seventh trumpet will contain the bowls or the vials. So it's kind of like pulling out a telescope, and one part extends out of another part. So the seventh seal is going to be the seven trumpets. But let me read what's said here. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That is a tremendous statement to think that in heaven that all praise stops. There is silence for a half an hour in heaven whenever this seventh seal is open. And that silence is in, in anticipation of what is about to come, what is about to unfold. But I want to go on, and it says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having, seven golden sen having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, watch this, which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So I want to go back to verse 4 for a moment. So these judgments that are about to come, the trumpets and the bowls that are about to come, they are an answer to the prayers of the saints. Because for over the, over, since the beginning of the world, since sin entered into the world, man has cried for God 
to basically bring his wrath upon the wicked. And so those prayers over the years have been stored up. These are prayers that have been stored up for thousands of years. Watch the verse again. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So these prayers are prayers that have been stored for thousands of years. And now they come out. And I wanted to just take you back and show you some of the cries of God's people to help you to understand how this all fits into place. In, in, Revelation, or in Genesis 4, 8 through 10, whenever Cain kills his brother Abel, watch what we read here. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I, I, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? Now watch this statement. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I want to just say this. There is innocent blood today that cries for the vengeance of God. I think of the, the unborn babies that have been slaughtered and the, and the blood that has been spilled in the name of health care as all of these babies have died. And I can assure you, it's no different with their blood than it is with the blood of, of Abel. But the blood of Abel cried unto God from the ground. And so all of these cries of the innocent, the blood of the, the innocence that has cried to God, those prayers are going to be answered. There's coming a day whenever those prayers will be answered. And that's what is said, if, if I were to back you up here again in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 8, whenever it says the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Let me show you another one. Psalm 9, 11 and 12 says this, Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion, declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. God does not forget the prayers of his people. They may not be answered right now, but there will be a time whenever those cries for God's vengeance to be poured out, they will be answered. Let me give you another one. Luke 18, 7 and 8, the first part of verse 8. It says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. So uh, back to this again. I just wanted to point out to you that as you enter into these this midpoint of the tribulation, that some of the, some of the judgment that is coming is a result of the prayers of the saints, that is the prayers that have been offered over thousands of years, they were not forgotten. The, the innocent blood that has cried out, it has not been forgotten. They have been stored up in heaven, and one day they will, the, all of these prayers will be brought out, and these cries will be answered as the judgment of God is poured upon the face of the earth. That brings me where we're at today. The Trumpet Judgments, Part 2. And what I want you to see, first of all, is the warning to the earthlings. Watch, if you would, verse 13 of Revelation chapter 8. Watch what is said here. And it says, this is after the fourth trumpet. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. It's a, that's a warning given by God to the earthlings, to those that are alive, living on the face of the earth, and the, the judgments that are to come are going to be three woes. And I will just say this about the woes, that the woe is so severe that anybody that is on the earth would want absolutely nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Three woes that are yet to be poured out. Now, with that said, watch the first one. It'll be trumpet number five. It's going to be the releasing of demons. Watch one through six of Revelation nine. Watch this. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. Now, that's not the stars like we think of, because watch this. And unto the uh, fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So this star is a person. This star is an angel. Watch this. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Stop for a moment. That's the abyss. 
That is the abyss. And let me just say this. That place exists today. And if, if somebody does not think that hell is a literal place, I'd like to draw your attention to that verse because there's two things that I see here. Number one is this, that the fire is real and it is literal because there is a smoke and the smoke is going to darken the sun and the moon. That's literal smoke. So that is a, this, this abyss, this hell that is opened up, this pit that is opened up, this is a literal place, and the fires are literal fires that will torment people that die in their sins. If you die and you're not saved and you end up in this place, that is the fire that will torment you. That place exists today. And, and not only that, I want you to see what's in this place. Watch verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Now let me just say this. These are demons. These are demonic spirits. This is the unleashing of, a, of, of demonic spirits upon the face of the earth. Let me go back to something. Let me just take your mind back without taking you to the verses. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we talked about the fact that after, after the rapture of the church, the restraints will be released off of the demonic world. So in the beginning of the tribulation, this is, the, this is beyond the midpoint here. This is in the second half. This is in what's known as the great tribulation. But in the beginning of the tribulation, there will, the, the restraints will be taken from the demonic world. Today, there is, a, there is a restraint upon Satan and his demonic spirits. But in that day, it'll be released. And then it goes to this point right here. And now this bottomless pit, this abyss is opened up. And out of it comes these creatures that John describes as locusts. Watch verse 3 again. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. A terrible scene. Absolutely terrible. The pain from the sting, the pain from whatever these creatures inflict is so severe that men will desire to die but will be unable to do so. They won't even be able to take their own life. And we can only imagine what the scene would be like. But these demonic creatures come out and the scene will be absolutely terrifying. I, I thought about a, ver a couple verses. Watch Luke 21, 25 through 26. It says this, And there were signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Men's hearts, heart attacks. Men's hearts failing them for fear. No wonder. Watch 7 through 10. Watch what these creatures look like. And I can't draw the picture, so you'll have to do that in your own mind. But watch this. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of a woman, women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, and many, mighty horses, many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. Terrible creatures unleashed upon the face of the earth. On top of all of that is, uh, are the seal judgments that, are, that, have already been, that have already been poured out on the earth. And then, then you have the first four trumpet judgments that have already been poured out on the face of the earth. And now in the midst of all of it, now the abyss is opened up and now these demonic spirits that are absolutely terrifying are going to be on the face of the earth. I think Joel recorded something... Uh, 
about these, and I want you to see Joel really, whenever he wrote what I'm going to read for you, he had three ideas in mind. This, in his day, there was a literal plague of locusts, which that describes. There was an invasion of the Assyrians, the Syrians, which this describes. But it's also a future uh, prophecy about, I believe, what's going on right here. Watch what Joel writes in verses 1 through 11. He says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Very important to understand. No escape. No matter if somebody's a prepper or whatever they are, there is absolutely no escape. Verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots, you see the, the parallel with what John describes here. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of fire, noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as the strong people set in battle array. Before their face, and the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. That's, by the way, that's the result of famine. Just in case you're not aware of that. Verse 7. And they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run up upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That was the trumpet right before, by the way, the, uh, the fourth trumpet, in case you're wondering. Let me go on. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord, that's the tribulation, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? That's what's coming. Just that fifth trumpet alone should be enough to cause people to wake up and say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with this. Because these demonic spirits are going to be terrifying whenever they are released upon the face of the earth, as they come out of the abyss and they are released upon the face of the earth. And, and they won't be able to kill men, but they will be able to torment people. They will be able to torment people over and over and over again. Watch 11 and 12 of Revelation 9. Watch this. It says, And they had a king over them, which is called the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, destroyer. That's what it means. Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, there come two woes more hereafter. The next woe, listen to me, the next one will be the sixth trumpet, and then the next one will be the seventh trumpet, which will be all the bold judgments. The point is this. This is going to be devastating to the world, but it's not, it's not over. Watch the next one. Trumpet number six. Now you have a demonic army. Watch, uh, let me start in verse 12 again. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Here comes the sixth trumpet through verse 19. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard the voice of four horns the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had a trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So just stop. So there are, right now, based upon what is said here, we can understand that there are four angels, four fallen demonic spirits that are bound in the great river Euphrates. They are there for a reason. Watch verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were which were 
prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. For to slay, watch this, the third part of men. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. It's 200 million, by the way. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of janseth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which, which issued out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Here, this is a, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion about this. My personal thought is this is a demonic army, and I'm going to tell you why it's a demonic army, why I believe that, because there is no evidence in the Bible where this army here is led by four demons, four fallen angels that are locked up in, in the Euphrates River right now that will be loosened. There is no place in the Bible where, where a human army is ever led by demonic spirits. This is, I believe, a demonic army, and I think the horses that they are on, they are demonic also. But here's what I want you to understand. That whenever this trumpet sounds, and these, this demonic army sweeps across the earth, one-third of the world's population is going to die. One-third. Now, you combine that with that fourth seal judgment, whenever one-fourth of the world's population died, and now you're up to about one uh, a little over half of the world's population today there are eight billion people so if that were to happen today they, that would leave about four billion people that would die that's a lot of people four billion people in the world but the point is this is the devastation this is the judgment that is going to come upon the face of the earth you have the the opening of the abyss which releases all of those demonic spirits then you have these four angels that are in the Euphrates that come out and, and they organize this demonic army that sweeps across the face of the earth and they kill one third of the world's population. You would think this, that certainly that that is going to change the way people live their lives. But come back to verse 20. Watch this. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now, let me, let me just comment on that if I could. And then there's something else here that I want to point out to you. There are people that have heard about the tribulation period. They, a lot of people, the church has talked about this for a long time. And, and so there are, there's a lot of people in the world that, that know that the church talks about this period. And so what they, a lot of people think is this, well, you know what, if I, if I end up in that period, then I'll turn my life over to God and I'll get, I'll, 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 I'll get saved in that tribulation period. Well, I'm going to just draw your attention to this. Verse 20 again. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. They should not worship devils or idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither do they repent of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts. In other words, they go on with their sin like they always did. See that? There's no repentance whatsoever. Nothing. No change whatsoever. And you say, why is that? And I say this, because that's what happens to the human heart whenever mankind suppresses the truth of God. When you suppress, and we've talked about this over and over again, and I give you this because I care about you, but whenever you suppress the truth over and over and over again, then you come to this place where it doesn't matter what happens before your eyes. It's not going to change you. I'll say it this way. You get to the place where you will not repent and you will not come to Christ 
because you cannot repent and you cannot come to Christ because your heart has gotten so hard. We, on, in our study of Moses, and I know we've talked about this before, but I brought up in our study of Moses just what Pharaoh went through and how God sent Moses and Aaron into that guy and, and, and they talked and they warned him of what was to come and he, he continued to suppress the truth. He continued to reject God and he wouldn't let Israel go. And so the plagues continued to come. The 10 plagues that fell upon Egypt. Finally, on the 10th plague, at the death of the firstborn, after Egypt's economy was trashed and destroyed and there, there wasn't hardly anything left of the nation of Egypt because of the plagues, he said to Moses, he said, get out of here. Take your people and you go. They weren't going very long. And he had a change of mind. Not for the better. He decided that he was going to pursue Israel and that he was going to slaughter them. So he gathered his military together and away they went. You would think after the guy witnessed all of those plagues that there's no way that he would want to even have anything to do with God's people unless it would be to join up with them. But his heart had become hard. God, he hardened his own heart, but God also hardened his heart. So his heart became harder and harder and harder. He pursued Israel, and they came to the Red Sea, and he probably thought, we got them now because there's no place to go. The mountains on the right, the sea directly in front of them, no place for them to turn. And then, miraculously, the sea parts. And Israel goes through on dry ground. And there's a wall of water on both sides. You would think after what he had witnessed, there's no way in the world he'd walk into that situation. But whenever you have suppressed the truth so long and your heart has become so hard that you are completely blinded to the dangers of rebelling against God. And so he went right into the sea, got in the middle, and the wheels come off the chariots. God released the walls of water, and they all drowned. I often think of Pharaoh, the chances that he had, and he left to get by. And, and here, right here, you see it again. You see it again. These people, they have, they have had the these, they have had the six plagues or the six seal judgments, and then they they have had the five previous trumpet judgments or the six previous trumpet judgments, a third of the world's population. Billions of people have died, but these people won't even leave their sin. They won't even depart from their sin because, you see, their heart has become so hard that that's all they know. That's all they know. And so they will not come away. There was a time when they were, their hearts were tender, but that day's over. It's over. They've gone so far. There's a word here that I wanted to draw your attention to, and then I'll move on. Watch verse 20 again. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries. That's an interesting word. That is, uh, that word refers to drug use. I, I want you to listen to the words of Henry Morris on that thought. Listen to this, and I quote, During the awful days of the tribulation, the breakdown of law and order will mean that there will be no more restraints on drug use. Furthermore, the fearful judgments on the earth will drive many to drugs as a form of escapism. The merchants of the earth will gladly cooperate because of the great profits involved, unquote. See how it will all work? You can understand that in a way that it will all come together. But the sad part is this, all these opportunities, and yet they will not repent. I want to go on because there's something else. Along with the, we're going to come to trumpet number 7, that's in 1115. Jump over there if you would. Turn over to chapter 11, verse 15. There's something else in here that I want to, point out for a moment. Well, watch verse 15. Here's what it says. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, 
He shall reign forever and ever. Now, I'll tell you what that means. That means it's almost over. But you still have these bold judgments yet to come. Now come to chapter 15, verse 5, if you would. Jump over here. 15, 5. There's something before we look at the first bowl that I want you to see that should shock you. 15, 5 says this, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Verse 8, watch it. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. What's this? No man. God's in there by himself. No man can go in. No man can witness what goes on inside of that temple. So what is this about? What is, what is this? God has separated himself from the host of heaven. And he's in this temple in heaven and he's in the smoke from his glory and from his power. And nobody's able to go in. Listen to the words of Barnhouse. And I quote, What insight we have here of the holiness of God. And may, it not be allowed, may, may, may we not be allowed to think that beyond this hiding smoke, the heart of God is weeping. Even as the Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem, as he acknowledged that all the efforts of his mercy had been in vain, and that the city refused all of his offers of pardon and love. And as we shall be in heaven at that moment, yet outside of the presence of God, shall we not know that he suffers alone for the horror of the sin that separates men forever from himself and, and forces him to send them away into outer darkness forever, unquote. Let me say this. You think it doesn't break God's heart when somebody will not come to him? I think this scene makes it very clear that God's heart is broken. Because this is it. You, got these, you have these seven bowls that are about to, to be poured out upon the face of the earth. This is it. There's no more opportunity for the people. None whatsoever. This is the, the door is closed and so it's now judgment upon judgment. These, these last bowl judgments that are going to fall like the grand finale in a fireworks display, they're going to fall like hammer blows upon the face of the earth, and they are going to devastate the world as it all comes down to an end. Jesus will come back, and he will set up his kingdom. But what are the bowls like? What, 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 what causes God to go alone? And if so, to weep in his and in, in, in by his own self until all seven of these are fulfilled. doesn't come out until all seven are fulfilled. What goes on? Let me show you. Bowl number one starts with sores upon men. Watch, if you would, 16, chapter 16, 1 and 2. And heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vows of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vow upon the earth, and there fell noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. This judgment is, is only on upon those that have taken the mark of the beast, which is going to be a tremendous amount of people that are going to take that mark. It'll be a it'll be a open wound is exactly what it'll be. It'll be a sore, a festering sore that seems to be extremely painful. Some people liken them to ulcers that'll come. It's as if God says this, you take the mark of the beast and I will put a mark on you. That's what he does right here. And he puts this terrible, grievous, noisome sore upon those that had taken the mark of the beast. It goes on then. Bowl number two, 
all ocean life will die. Watch, if you would, verse 3. And a second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Now, if you remember previously, one of the other judgments, there was a third of the sea was afflicted. But now it's the entire saltwater supply. This is a major part of the earth's food supply, and it's all taken away. And it says that, that the sea itself becomes as the blood of a dead man. That would be like when a, when a, when a, when a man dies, that the blood would clot, and that's what the sea will be. Like one huge clot to where nothing will survive whatsoever. We can only imagine the stench that'll take place, that'll, that'll come up. But the worst thing is now the food supply is being depleted. Let me get you to the next one. Bold judgment number three. Fresh water turned to blood. Watch 16, 4 through 7. And a third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Let me go back to that judgment in verse 4. It turns the entire fresh water supply to blood. Okay, now back up just a little bit. You've got the sore that is upon the people, and now there is no way to wash the sore because the, wa the fresh water supplies have been turned to blood. There's no drinking water because they have been turned to blood. And somebody, said, somebody might say, well, that's rather harsh, and that's why verses 5 through 7 are there. Because in verse 5 we read again, And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. These are righteous judgments. They are fitting. Verse 6 explains why. For they have shed the blood of the saints and of the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Let me just say this, okay? Listen to me. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets. They killed the very people that carried the gospel to them. They kill them. In the tribulation period, those that carry the gospel to the lost are slaughtered. The majority of them are slaughtered. And because they have killed those that had the answer that they needed, they had the message that would have set them free from, from eternal damnation, they, because they've killed them, God says, okay, you want to shed blood, I'll give you blood. Now you have blood to drink. Now you have blood to drink. And all the fresh water supply at this time it's gone. Then you take the next one on top of that. Bold judgment number four, excessive heat. Excessive heat. Watch, if you would, verse 8 of chapter 16. Watch what this says. 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. So this one doesn't go on the earth, nor does it go on mankind. This bold judgment's poured out upon the sun. I find it very interesting that what we are seeing today in our world and about how man thinks that he can control the climate. And so we hear, all, we, we hear this, you know, that there's global warming and, and so we got to do away with fossil fuels. This past week, I thought it was rather ironic that, that while they're crying about global warming, that God sends the cold clear down to the Mexican border. And they want their green energy, and it got so cold it froze the windmills, and they wouldn't even function. I don't think that's a coincidence. And I look at all of this right here, and I, and I understand that... What, what's going on? What man has made all of these false gods is he's worshiped the earth. And in these, in these bold judgments, he loses control all of, the, of all of that. And he can't control anything, can't control it anymore. It, it's almost like here with the fourth bold judgment that it's, that it's almost like God says, okay, you think there's global warming? 
I'll show you what global warming is. And so this fourth bowl is poured out upon the sun. And it scorches men with fire. Verse 9 says, And men were scorched with great heat. And watch what they do. And they blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. They wouldn't even, listen, they would not even turn to him. They wouldn't cry out to him for help. But instead they blasphemed God. It's a condition that they have got in because of the rejection. Watch the... Uh, Watch the, uh, the fifth bowl judgment. Watch the darkness, starting in verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Let, let me just say something, okay? His kingdom is going to consist of the entire globe. So we have a global darkness. Watch how bad. Something is in that darkness, because watch the rest of that verse. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed God, the God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Over and over we're told that. It's, it's interesting that the very tongues that blaspheme God, they end up punishing their own tongues for they gnaw on their own tongues into a darkness that is so deep that it can be felt and it, whatever is in that darkness, whatever is behind that, brings a tremendous amount of pain to these people. Then you go to the next one. Bold judgment number six. Now you got demonic deception. Watch 12 through 16. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that would be Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There is the satanic trinity, by the way. Okay, but watch this. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Let, let me, I'll keep reading. I want to talk about something here. And behold, I come as a, Jesus puts this right in the middle here. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So this is a preparation for the battle of Armageddon. I find it very interesting, those that sign up, those that join up with the armies for the battle of Armageddon are going to be under demonic deception. They'll be under demonic deception. And, and that reminds me of this too, the fact that no doubt they believe that they're doing what is right. They have no idea what they are marching into. They have none because they are under the deception of this satanic trinity. And while they think that what they are doing is maybe just and noble, they have no idea that they are marching to their death, none whatsoever, to the battle of Armageddon. When Christ will come back in that campaign of Armageddon, and he will slaughter these people. And there will be a river of blood that will run four feet deep, 200 miles long. It's a lot of blood. Four feet deep, 200 miles long. That'll be the slaughter. But I want to go back to that deception. And I want to say this to you. You continue to suppress the truth of God. You continue to say, you know what? I know I need to be saved, but, but right now is just not a good time. And so you think to yourself, I'm going to walk away. Someday I'll come back. Someday, someday maybe, here's what I used to think before I was saved. Right before I die, I'll get saved. That's fine if you knew when that was. That's fine if, 
if you got a notification the day before that tomorrow at one o'clock that you were going to die, but you're not going to get that notification. And you, and you don't have to be, listen, you don't have to be sick. Tonight we're going to talk about Moses. You know what he did before he died? He worked right up for God. He served God. He copied down the law to give to the Levites. He wrote a song that God gave to him. Then he turned around and he climbed Mount Pisgah. Now listen, let me just tell you something. He got up to where he could see clear across Canaan. He could see from one side to the other. The, the, the man, it, says, it tells us that his eyes were not dim and, and he never lost his strength. The guy's as healthy, as, as strong as a bull. He's 120 years old, but, but he's still strong and he's still going. He's able to climb mountains and he gets up there and God shows him all the land and God says, okay, Moses, it's time to die. And he dies. And so you think this, well, I got to be sick. I got to have something. No, you don't. Because there is a boundary that has been set by God in your life. There's a day that is appointed, and you don't know when it is. And so, therefore, going back to this, if you knew when it was, then, then you could say, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll trust in Christ, unless your heart's so hard that you can't. But I'll throw in something else right here. You go ahead and you suppress the truth of God. You go ahead and you rebel against God. You go ahead and say thanks, but no thanks. And you be careful. Because one of the things that may happen to you is terrible demonic deception. To where in your life you think you're doing what is right, and you don't even understand that you're under demonic influence. You think that doesn't happen? I'm telling you it's happening right now in our nation. There are people that are in D.C. that think that they are doing what is right, and they don't even understand that they are under demonic possession, some of them, and influence others. That they are under the control of the wicked one. Organizing, <clears throat> organizing the stage for the coming of the Antichrist. It can happen to you. It can happen to you. It happens to these people in the tribulation. It happens to people today. We've talked about this before. You say, well, how would that ever happen to me? Well, listen, all you need is a false god in your life. All you need is an idol. What is it? What, it, it, could, be, it could be anything. It could be your house. It can be, it can be uh, money. It can be your job. It can be... Uh, a hobby that you like, it, it, whatever. But here's what you need to understand, that demons will attach themselves to idols. It's what Paul warned the Corinthians about. So you get hooked on to an idol, whatever it is. I don't know, I'll just use something. Let's say it's a car, I don't know. Let's just say you got this thing and that's what controls you and that's Boy, you just kind of live for this or whatever, and that's where you're at, and, and that, that's what you give all your focus to, and that becomes an idol. And if so minded, and if a demon is permitted, he can attach himself to that idol to the point where that begins to control you and influence the way you think. And you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it, just like these people right here. To you, you're fine. You're going down a path that you ought to go down. You don't even know what you're walking into. You don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. Let me give you the last bold judgment. Widespread destruction, if you would. Watch uh, 17. And the seventh angel sound, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. It's over. And there were voices and thundering, thunders and lightnings, and there were great there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. That's an interesting statement too, because you remember the earthquake back in the seal judgments that moved every island and every mountain out of its place. This one's far greater. Far greater. Verse nineteen. 
And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's for another time to study Babylon. Here's verse 20. And every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. There's how strong that earthquake is. The mountains are leveled. But verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men, here we go again, blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Exceeding great because the weight of the hailstones were about a talent. Some people say that's 110 pounds. We can't only imagine. Hailstones, five-pound hailstones. I remember years ago it hailed wherever my sister and brother-in-law lived, and my brother-in-law, uh, whenever we visited, he had a bag that he pulled out of the freezer of the hailstones. They were a little bit bigger than golf balls. And they just smashed the windows out of cars and stripped the siding off the houses, the foliage off the trees, and knots on his head because he ran out in the yard to get them while they were still falling. Uh, and he got pummeled with a few of them. But you wouldn't survive these. You wouldn't. A hundred, a hundred pounds, fifty pound weight falling out of the sky would be would go through any structure. These are probably somewhere around 100 pounds. Let me get down to what, why I did this. Why, why this series? Why these four parts? What's it all about? It's about you. It's about you because I don't want to see any of our people left behind for the tribulation. You don't want that. And I'm telling you the direction that our world's going. We may go a long time. And, and we, you and I might not live to see the rapture. We might not live to see the rapture. That may be after our time because once the rapture starts, it starts these judgments and God's not willing that any perish but that all should come to repentance. But at the same time, I know this, that before you get to the back doors of the church today, that could happen. The rapture could happen and this world could be plunged in to this seven-year period that's going to come on the face of the earth. But you don't have to go there. You don't have to be a part of that because God has made a way for you to be able to escape that. Because Jesus, his son, died for you. You understand that? Your sin was so great against a holy and a righteous God. Your sin is so great that you were separated from him. And if you die in that sin, you're separated forever. That's how serious sin is. You can't brush it off like it's nothing. It, it, it's, it, is, it has separated you from God. If you've never been saved, there is a separation. There is a divide between you and God. There is a barrier, and that barrier is your sin. And, and until that barrier is removed, you can't have a relationship with him. You can't do it. I don't care how much money you put in, a, in the boxes in the back. I don't care what you, what, how many times you come to church. I don't care how you help out people, that's not going to earn you a place in heaven. That's not going to get you a relationship with God because that won't pay for your sin. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Did you get that? Listen to me. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. God requires a blood sacrifice. Now what are you going to do? Now what are you going to do with your good works? Because there's no blood sacrifice there. You say, where's the blood sacrifice come in? It comes in at the cross. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross and he poured out his blood as he hung on the cross to pay your sin debt, to pay for your sin and mine. He died so that I could have a relationship with him, to do away with the barrier between me and God so that, so that we could come together and we could have this intimate relationship. And so now I have... I have a God that I walk with now, and I'm in this relationship with him. And that's what he wants for you. 
That's what he wants for you. And if you will will repent of your sin and you will put your faith in Jesus Christ and believe that he died and was buried and rose again on the third day for you, God will forgive you. You don't have to do anything special. It's by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all about faith. Jesus already did it all. You can't do anything except believe. And whenever you do, let me show you. Instead of going through this, here's what God has for you. Watch this. should say 21, 1 through 7. This is later. If you know Christ as Savior, there's a day coming whenever this earth is going to be destroyed and God is going to create a new one. And here it comes. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Let me ask you a question. You thirsty? I'm not talking about for a bottle of water. I'm talking about is there something within you that's missing? in your life. That's a thirst. And what you're looking for is what Jesus has to offer. He that overcometh, that's the one that trusts in Christ as Savior, by the way. That's the overcomer. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It's what God offers to you. He offers that to you. You don't have to You don't have to get any closer to the tribulation than what we've read and studied in this little series, this four-part series. You don't have to get any closer. And and I will say this, and then I will close out. That tribulation is awful. But that is absolutely nothing compared to eternal separation from God, which is if you die in your sins, you will experience it. That's not even, this isn't even close. Not even close. So the choice is yours. I I can't force it on you. If I could, I would, but I can't. All I can do is present it. It's up to you about what you're going to do with Jesus. What are you going to do with him? Because he's the answer for you. He's the one that has made a way so that you can have a personal relationship with God. But you have to come to Christ. You have to put your faith in Him. You have to say, you know what, God, I don't want the direction I'm going anymore. I want what you have. And I believe that Jesus died for me upon the cross and was buried and rose again the third day. It's what God is wanting from you. He wants repentance and you turning to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. For Lord, he's ultimately, number one, he has brought us into a relationship with you, which we didn't have before. Then on top of all of that, Father, we have the comfort of knowing that we will never go through the tribulation. We won't see that time on the earth because we will be raptured away. And if we die before then, then to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Either way, Lord, we will escape that seven-year period. But those that don't know Christ, and there are many, there are many, those that don't know Christ, Lord, they will go into that tribulation period and face the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls if they live that long. They don't die in the beginning sometime or midway through. Life will be terrible. Father, I don't know the hearts of the people that are here. I don't know every heart. I don't, but you do. 
And there may be one here today, and they don't know you as Savior. And there may be two here. There may be a couple here that doesn't know you as Savior. My prayer is this. That today, Father, before they leave, they will come and they will seek me out. And they will say, Pastor, we want to be saved. We want to know for sure how we can escape the tribulation. Father, if there be one that walks away from here by suppressing the truth today, might the convictions in their life be miserable. Don't let them sleep. If they fall asleep, Lord, let them have nightmares about dying in their sin. Lord, help them, drive them to the point of repentance so that they will turn to you. Father, help them not to harden their hearts, I pray. Lord, now I commit this to you. I am the messenger, Father. I am the one that casts out the seed. You are the one that gives the growth and produces the fruit. So, Lord, I trust it to you. And thank you ahead of time, for, Lord, I know that you will use it somehow, some way. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank <clears throat> you.